Welcome back geology fans. Soils across the world are as varied as individuals of a species because they are affected by a number of soil forming factors that can act along a continuous spectrum of possibilities that mix to give a great variety of soil. But we scientists want to classify and will place these varied soils into named boxes. The soil forming factors include climate, topography, parent material, organisms, and time. Climate gives the general pattern that wetter climates give thicker, more well-developed soil profiles, with the warmer wet climates getting the thickest and most well-developed soil. Dry climates have the thinnest soil profiles and often have bare, unaltered rock exposed at the surface. Topography mostly affects the ability of water to drain through the developing soil, but also the ability of weathering rock to accumulate at that location. Very steep areas are bare of soil as weathered rock is carried away and can't accumulate to begin the soil forming process. Upland areas that are less steep can accumulate weathered rock material while still being well drained and can form thicker, more well developed soil profiles compared to lowland areas that don't drain well and have thinner, less well developed soil. Parental material means the bedrock that is weathering to give the mineral fraction of the soil and mainly contributes the relative amounts of clay, silt, and sand into the soil. A soil developed from a limestone is a very different soil made from a sandstone or a granite. And different soil types can support different kinds of vegetation, which leads us to organisms. Vegetation aids in chemical weathering through organic acids and mechanical weathering through root wedging. But those roots also help lower erosion and allow soil to accumulate in an area. But organisms also means bacteria and fungi that help break down the larger organics and the arthropods and worms along with the larger burrowing organisms that help to turn over the soil and allow for water to penetrate even the less permeable soils. All of these soil forming factors influence the other factors in turn. And that is especially true of the last factor. Time. Time will allow the other factors more power to process rock into soil. Did you ever think different soils are different ages? A geologist interested in the history of an area would be interested in how far along the pedogenic, or soil forming, processes have progressed. Knowing which minerals are reactive and likely to weather away first, versus which minerals are resistant to erosion, and equilibrium products are the main pedogenic indicators. Just a quick reminder that the Bowens Reaction series we visited in episode 14 not only tells us the order in which minerals freeze out of a melt, but also the relative stability at the surface, with the minerals at the top of the series like olivine, pyroxene, and calcium-rich plagioclase being the least stable at the surface and chemically weather away the fastest. Quartz at the bottom is a stable mineral, and we should not be surprised to find it even in a well-weathered soil profile. But the geologist is also interested in secondary minerals that might be produced from weathered byproducts. Weathering not only decomposes primary minerals, but creates much more stable secondary minerals as the system reaches equilibrium. Or we can say the secondary minerals reach equilibrium in the temperature pressure environment in which we find them, and so are very stable. When metals are released from primary minerals, they often end up as amorphous hydrous oxides, with the most common metals being iron, silica, aluminum, and titanium. When feldspar is weathered, we get secondary clay minerals like kaolinite, which is almost as stable as quartz at the surface. Recall that clay minerals are aluminum silicate minerals made of the silica tetrahedron, a silica bonded to four oxygens in sheets, and by aluminum octahedra, which is aluminum bonded to six oxygens in separate sheets. Most clays have either a 1-1 structure, meaning the base layering is silica sheet, then aluminum sheet, and repeat or the 2-1 structure in which an aluminum sheet is sandwiched between two silica sheets, and that structure is repeated. 
In previous episodes, we discussed the risk of 2-1 clays, as they can expand when wet and contract when dry, causing swelling soil. Other clay varieties often mix up the combination of 1-1 and 2-1 structure together. The main 1-1 clay in soil is kaolinite, where cations bond both aluminum and silicon, and the bonding between the aluminum-silicon sheets is strong enough to prevent absorption of water and swelling. That also means the 1-1 clays, like kaolinite, are less plastic, harder to mold, like modeling clay, than 2-1 clays. It also means there's less surface area possible in a 1-1 clay than a 2-1 clay. Besides kaolinite, the other common 1-1 clays are dickite, nacrite, halloisite, and allophane. The main 2-1 clays are best broken into the smectite group, the mica group, and the chlorite group. The smectite group is characterized by new ions replacing aluminum in the aluminum sheet, which can make a crazy range of different clay minerals, but the main one is montmorillonite. With some of the weakest bonding between the three sheet structure, montmorillonite has a high swelling soil potential and plasticity. And 2-1 clays like montmorillonite also have more surface area than a 1-1 clay like kaolinite, which leads to one other important factor for clays, which is the cation exchange capacity. How well can the mineral grab onto ions like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, you know, the, the major plant fertilizers, store that fertilizer in the soil, and then give it back to plants when needed? 1-1 clays may not swell, but ions can only exchange on outer surfaces, so the cation exchange capacity, the CEC, is low in 1-1 clays like kaolinite, but relatively high in the 2-1 clay montmorillonite. Illite is the main 2-1 mica clay, which puts aluminum into some of the slots of the silicon sheet, but the imbalance in charge resulting means potassium gets between the layers to bond them a bit stronger than in a montmorillonite. So illite is between kaolinite and montmorillonite in swelling, plasticity, and cation exchange capacity. The other mica clays are obviously muscovite and biotite in small, small flakes, and less obviously glauconite and that vermiculite in your potting soil, because it has a high cation exchange capacity. I hope you can guess the most common clay in the chlorite group. It's chlorite, but you might also see chamosite. The chlorite group looks like a 2-1 smectite, but the sandwiches are held together by an octahedral layer and so is designated a 2-1-1 clay and is closer to kaolinite in bonding strength, keeping the crystal from absorbing water, not swelling, and thus is less plastic and has a lower cation exchange capacity. It is true that kaolinite can be made directly from weathering K-spar, potassium feldspar, orthoclase feldspar, microcline. Just reminding you, all of these names refer to the same salmon pink mineral. But kaolinite can be produced by various pathways. So understanding the degree of weathering starts with an understanding that initially the ions released from the minerals present may dominate the system, but as climate acts through leaching water, climate drivers will eventually come to dominate as the system reaches equilibrium. Thus, no single secondary mineral is used to tell degree of weathering, rather the assemblage of secondary minerals in the soil is used. At the same time, specific clay minerals will dominate in mature soils under various climatic conditions, as will the oxides of iron and aluminum, which will only be removed if the leaching fluid becomes very acidic, under a pH of 2 or 3. Another way to gauge maturity of soil and rock weathering is to look at the mass of the major oxides in the parent rock, compared to the weathered rotten rock called sapropel. Aluminum will only move under very acidic conditions, as with ferric iron, but abundant ferrous iron being oxidized means the oxides of iron like hematite and limonite will actually increase in maturing soils. The biggest changes happen in the most mobile elements like calcium, sodium, or magnesium. 
Lastly, we can look at how much various minerals at the surface of parent rocks have weathered, and knowing average mineral weathering rates determine how long this rock has been chemically weathered to a soil overburden. With all the variables of parent mineralogy, degree of leaching due to climate and vegetation, introduction and removal of various elements and compounds, and secondary mineral formation and further reactions, it should be no surprise that not all soil is created equal. And the degree of variation of soil types produced means that we scientists will try to put them types in boxes, to label and define them. To do this, we must recognize the major patterns first and the properties that define them. And that will be the focus next time, here on Earth Explorations.